talk about you know alcoholism and the treatment of uh, alcohol withdrawal first, and then we'll talk about some of the FDA approved medications to help with alcoholism. Okay. So in 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 this uh, module, we will talk about the various alcohol withdrawal syndromes, which guaranteed the boards you know love to make sure that you know about the various withdrawal syndromes and where they occur in, uh, in timing wise you know after patients last last drink and we'll spend a little bit of time you know of you know talking about various uh, different protocols for assessing the risk of withdrawal and approaches to treatment so I, I actually like this slide and I've, and I've included it today because it's a reminder to me a reminder to us that even though alcohol is legal and we can get easily distracted with everything pertaining to the opioid crisis, that alcohol is probably a, one of the only substances known to man that can harm every single organ system, right? And that we shouldn't minimize its, its short-term and long-term you know, effects because you know, alcoholism very much so is a bad disease that happens to good people. You know, people die, unfortunately, from a, you know, secondary medical or emotional a, you know, effects from alcoholism every single day, and I certainly don't want us to lose lose sight of that. You know, as I tell my patients and my family members, um, I know that nobody wakes up one day and decides, you know what, I think I want to have alcoholism, right? I want to, you know, piss off my husband, and I want to, you know, lose my job, you know, and I want to develop cirrhosis. I think that's that's what I want to do, right? You know, I want to disappoint my kids and forget you know, to show up for their baseball game. Or when I do, uh, that's what I want to do. I want to create a show and be that obnoxious, you know, parent that, get, that gets all belligerent when they don't score, right? It's a bad disease that happens to good people. It's a bad disease that has its, a, a lot of, you know, genetic predisposition, a lot of, you know, genetic underpinnings that do contribute, right? It's kind of like having an allergy backwards, right? Those, a lot of the genetic predisposition that contributes to, are you the, the type of person that you know can have a drink you know and then put it down and your first drink doesn't lead to the fifth the fifth to the tenth the tenth to the twentieth you know or were you born with that switch that it allows you to exhibit control over your alcohol consumption were you born with that switch that was kind of broken right so bad disease that happens to good people and alcohol interestingly as as a property as a substance or, or, or as a property is is included as you guys know in a lot of like household cleaning items or even in mouthwash and part of that has to do with the fact that alcohol helps to you know denature proteins or denature the walls that hold things together right so when it comes to cleaning grime or grease that's exactly what you want alcohol to do, right? To separate the walls that keep the dirt together so that they can clean things and clean them up. But alcohol, when ingested and taken, you know, orally, does that same thing to everything it touches in our system along the way, right? And that's why alcohol's harmful effects can harm every single organ system and lead to cancer, a, a, you know, esophageal cancer, uh, it contributes data to support that it contributes to breast cancer, various, you know, GI types of cancers. Um, it can lead to pancreatitis, you know, to hepatitis, to, a, you know, osteoporosis, a, to seizures, like a lot of harmful effects that can happen just because of that property a, alone. So let's start off with a question. The American Medical Association's alcohol consumption guidelines state that women should limit their weekly alcohol consumption to fewer than how many drinks? Is it A, 7? Is it B, 14? C, 21, D, 28, or E, 35? And the answer is seven. And again, in a question like this, you know, be mindful of if they're asking you for the guidelines for men or women because they are different. So it's important to understand that a standard drink is defined as 14 grams of ethanol and 14 eight grams of ethanol is the equivalent of a 12 ounce, you know, a beer, a five ounce glass of wine, or 1.5 ounce spirits. You know, and certainly quantifying how much our patients are, 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 are using or how much they're drinking is important, uh, you know, not because we define alcoholism, you know, based on how many drinks you have or if you're having your first drink before noon, 
right? And it's not, you know, it's not alcoholism until you, you know, if you can hold your, your drinks and start drinking at the end of the day, then it's not alcoholism, or it's not that if you only drink on weekends, you know, a, and it's not alcoholism until you're a daily drinker. Um, so the amounts, you know, matter, you know, in part for research purposes, you know, and so that we can have a common language, and in two, to be able to, you know, to quantify, you know, consumption maybe in the event of helping to plan you know, for detoxification. But at the end, end, end of the day, alcoholism, like addiction in general, is a relationship that you develop with this substance that you have found, you know, that helps you, you know, to, you know, soothe your, you know, soothe your physical pain, your emotional pain that, uh, you know, contributes to helping relieve you from sadness that you use in celebratory events. It's a relationship that you develop with a substance more than something that we define by number of drinks consumed. Um, that, that, being, that, that being said, there are limits for, for men and for women. Um, and so the, the, the limits for women are no more than seven standard drinks you know, per week and certainly no greater than four drinks per sitting or per day. And in men, it's no more than 14 drinks per week and certainly no more than five drinks per day. And it's important you know, to clarify that because one, not only with heavy drinking come heavy consequences, but two, it's not the same to consume your seven drinks as a woman all in one setting, you know, and forcing your liver to, you know, to clear that much alcohol at one time than to drink them, you know, periodically or sporadically throughout the week. So there is a clarification of binge drinking, which is defined as consuming within a two hour period four or more drinks for women or five or more drinks for men. Okay, and let's transition on to another question. A 25-year-old administrator has been binge drinking regularly for the last five years. She stopped yesterday and now feels shaky and wonders if, is it, if it is safe for her to just stop on her own. How would you assess whether she's at risk for alcohol withdrawal or not? So is it A, reassure her that women in her age group are very unlikely to have serious withdrawal symptoms. B a detailed history of her drinking in the last 28 days will reveal if she is at risk or not. C, a review of her vital signs, heart rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure is the best way to predict withdrawal risk. D, um, assess her symptoms using the Clinical Institute Withdrawal Assessment of Alcohol, revised, which is the CWA R. Or E, there is no way to predict if she is at risk. And the correct answer is D, assess her symptoms using the, the CEWA scale. So the, the CEWA scale, which many of you guys are probably familiar with, is an, an you know, efficient uh, you know, assessment, takes less than five minutes to complete, that gives us, that it's a very objective way of assessing alcohol withdrawal risk that can be used in various treatment protocols to help guide pharmacologic therapy. And um, you know it's important to be familiar with the with the CEWA scale. Uh, we'll go over it, uh, you know, shortly, because it is estimated that one of every five patients admitted into a hospital abuses alcohol. And the last thing we would want, you know, when somebody's admitted to a medical floor for congestive heart failure, when somebody's admitted into the hospital for a hip replacement surgery, is to not assess how much they've been drinking, how long they've been drinking, and to unfortunately have them come out of surgery in full-blown DTs. And as we mentioned before, you know, alcoholics tend to minimize their use uh, of how much you're drinking, so it's important to clarify to them that we're asking you know, about amounts of drinking, not because we're judgmental, um, but because we really need to be able to anticipate medication management, both short-term and long-term. Um, unrecognized alcohol withdrawal can lead to potentially life-threatening consequences, including seizures and delirium uh, tremens, which is alcohol withdrawal delirium. So this slide, again, is verbatim from DSM-5. Uh, alcohol withdrawal is defined as the presence of two or more symptoms that start to occur within hours or days that can follow either cessation or reduction in use. And that is autonomic hy hyperactivity, you know, sweating or a heart rate greater than 100, increased hand tremors, insomnia, nausea or vomiting, transient visual, auditory or tactile hallucinations, psychomotor agitation, anxiety, or the presence of generalized tonic-clonic seizures. And uh, I think it's important that the DSM-5 clarifies that 
it's either cessation or reduction in use because I have plenty of time encountered, you know, the case of, you know, the wife that's trying to prove to her husband that she does not have alcoholism and that she can control her drinking. And just to show it to him, you know, she'll show that I don't have to have, you know, a eight glasses of wine with dinner. I can control my drinking and I'm going to go down to four. Right? And by just, sometimes by just cutting back on your alcohol consumption, you can put yourself at risk for alcohol withdrawal um, and, all, and, and any other potential alcohol withdrawal syndromes. So the epidemiology of alcohol withdrawal is not well studied, but we know that significant symptoms can occur in anywhere from 13 to 71 percent of, of individuals presenting for detoxification. Um, up to 10% of individuals undergoing alcohol withdrawal will require inpatient medical treatment, and the mortality, certainly if left untreated, can be 2% you know, or, or higher. Um, one of the, uh, so this is actually in, you know, another one of my favorite slides. I'm, I, I grow attached after teaching so much to some slides that become my favorite. And this is actually one of my, my, my favorites because it really helped me to understand how alcohol withdrawal you know, happens and the importance of identifying it early. So the, the quick and easy way of, of, of explaining this using the seesaw analogy is that you know, our, our, our brains have you know, various neurotransmitters. Some are inhibitory, some are excitatory. The main inhibitory neurotransmitter is GABA and the main excitatory is glutamate. And the brain is always trying to do be a, you know be a lot about you know be a, a lot of feedback you know mechanisms to keep our brains at homeostasis. When you drink alcohol long enough, hard enough, because alcohol is a depressant of the central nervous system, you're going to increase your depressant tone or your GABA tone, right? And so you, what your brain is going to do in a response to try to overcompensate that increased GABAergic tone, or increased depressive tone that you've created with chronic alcohol use is that it's going to start to produce a lot of glutamate behind the scenes to bring your brain back to equilibrium, right? What happens when you either, you know, cut down or stop drinking altogether is that you abruptly remove that inhibitory GABA tone from that seesaw and all of that glutamate that's been accumulating in the background comes back with a vengeance. So it's the excitatory glutamate, right, that's responsible for the tremors that happen in acute, you know, alcohol withdrawal, the increased hypertension, the risk for seizures, um, the insomnia, uh, you know, that, that follows even in a post-acute withdrawal setting. All of that is very highly glutamatergically driven just from having removed that GABAergic tone. Um, and so, depending on how many hours have lapsed since your last drink, you can start to present with a variety of alcohol withdrawal syndromes. So certainly within the first, you can start to see, you know, early minor withdrawal as early as six hours after somebody's, you know, last drink, up to 48 hours, and those can happen in different, you know, shapes and, and sizes. More often than not, the risk for, a, you know, for seizures starts at around 24 hours, up to 48 hours after somebody's last drink, as well as a, a hallucinosis can, la can begin around 24 hours. Um, hallucinosis can actually last until even, it can start at 24 hours, but it can even go on to five days after somebody's last drink. And certainly the big concern is the concern for um, emerging uh, delirium tremens or alcohol withdrawal delirium, which can happen you know, 48 hours uh, after somebody's last drink. Um, the boards like to make sure that you know more or less what the alcohol withdrawal you know timelines are, and they may give you vignettes to that to that effect. So alcohol withdrawal seizures, uh, if they you know do occur, their peak incidence is at around 24 hours of cessation or decrease. If they occur, they tend to be generalized tonic-clonic <coughs> seizures or partial seizures. They can often repeat, bless you, within three to six hours. A contrary to common belief, status epilepticus is, is rare and happens in less than 3% of cases. And it's important to identify and treat alcohol with withdrawal uh, early because, again, left untreated, 30 to 50% have the risk to progress on to, to DTs. It's important and certainly uh, in, in either inpatient or, or outpatient set settings to consider you know, in your differential other etiologies such as head trauma, central nervous system infections, and neoplas neoplasms. And uh, the, 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 the treatment for alcohol withdrawal 
most of the literature supports you know using benzodiazepines for alcohol withdrawal you can add anticonvulsants you know i you know on board as well whether it's you know gabapentin or some some detoxes that i work with you know use leva or you know or kepra um, a, you know, some have protocols with, you know, with oxcarbazepine or trileptal, but most of the time, you know, most detoxes will use a combination of a, you know, of a benzodiazepine. The mnemonic OTL or out the liver stands for oxazepam, temazepam, and lorazepam, a, which should be used, you know, in, in patients for whom you have some kind of concern that they have any kind of elevated, you know, liver function test or they have cirrhosis already, you should use the ones that undergo extra hepatic metabolism, which again are oxazepam, temazepam, and lorazepam. So you may have a vignette that they may ask you, you know, which is the ideal benzo that you would use in somebody that you, you either are unknown of their liver status, you have concerns about their liver status, and that would be the answer right there.